Uh, well, welcome to the Libertarian Alliance. Uh, we have a meeting every month, and you're welcome to come to every month's meeting. Uh, this time it's uh, uh, Richard uh, Wellings, and he's going to talk about uh, some lessons from uh, uh, it's pretty fun. It's uh, why why has libertarian strategy failed? Insights from public uh, choice theory. <laughs> Sorry about that. I always, I always get the uh, title wrong. I don't know why. We treasure it. Sorry, sorry, Richard. But with that, I better hand over to Richard before I make any more mistakes. Thanks, David. I, I must say I'm feeling um, somewhat in awe tonight, uh, speaking in such grand surroundings. <laughs> 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 I'll do, I'll do my they best. Do, they do say that all has shifted from being awesome <laughs> to awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the title, um, the title was, you know, it's a bit provocative. I'm not quite that depressed. Why has libertarian strategy failed? But nonetheless, you know, just thinking about some recent developments, um, all this um, Big Brother police state nonsense on the horizon, the Snoopers Charter, mass surveillance, all the rest of it. Um, not just from Brussels, but also coming from what calls itself the Conservative Party. Um, so this raft of regulation, um, national living wage. It might sound like a trivial thing, but really, this really just drove me nuts. The idea of a national minimum bedroom size, which came out a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I mean, you know, it just shows the sort of mentality of these people, and in, in a sense. You know how libertarians have failed to get through to them. Um, yeah, the sense of gloom also partly comes from my work. I should say that um, I, I've worked at the um, Institute of Economic Affairs for n over nine years now, but this um, talk is very much in a personal capacity. But as part of that job, I do come into contact with you know, journalists, politicians, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and often these are let's these are people who we consider one of us, you know, sort of sympathetic to libertarian ideas. And um, the problem is when you get to talk to them, they still believe in all this status nonsense. You know, think <clears throat> I do a lot of work on transport and I was with one of our supposed friends in the Conservative Party and he was all in favour of things like Boris Island, this, you know, big state, big government intervention, taxpayer funded big government projects. Um, you know, massive taxi regulation across the board. And you think, you know, if, if we haven't got three to these people, there's sort of half a dozen so-called friends in the Conservative Party. You know, what hope is, though, we, we really have... This really is getting depressing. Is that that's before we even get to the Wets and the Camerons types and the neocons and so forth. Um, <clears throat> it's also the same with a lot of the people that work at so-called free market think tanks as well. They're not libertarians at all. They're um, you know, neoliberals, sort of freedmanites, uh, neocons. And actually, the, if you look at, say, if you've been following a lot of these people on Twitter over the past few days, you'll have seen a lot of them have, who describe themselves as libertarians have actually outed themselves as neocons over the last few days in response to the Paris attacks. So it's very interesting. That's, I also found depressing as well that you've seen these these sort of people who call themselves libertarians but are actually in favour of a lot of big state stuff. So, um, <clears throat> um, and also I think a few years ago, about maybe ten years ago, uh, the movement uh, got a false sense of optimism because um, there is a concentration, a disproportionate number of libertarians in the sort of IT field who were comp in the computing for your computer nerds to use that phrase and um, I think that gave us a bit of a spurt in the early days of blogging and social media it gave us you know, a bit of an advantage for a few years because we had a disproportionate influence just because of the technical knowledge of that niche uh, within society but now a lot of that stuff's gone more, more mainstream and you see that that advantage has pretty much dissipated and if you look at the number of you know, Twitter followers and things like that you know, some of these people uh, like Owen Jones and so on and so forth, they in a different league. I mean, you've got uh, possibly the, the top performing libertarian in, in, I'm talking about proper libertarians here, sort of minimal state or sort of anarchists. 
probably the, the top performing one's got about 20,000 followers, which is really nothing compared with all the other competing ideologies. So, um, you know, we've lost that advantage that we had a few years ago, but I think it was just a sort of particular uh, period of time um, when, we, when we made a lot of progress. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the structure of the talk, um, the first part's going to question the hypothesis that um, libertarian strategy has failed thus far. Um, and the second part will present possible explanations, uh, particularly drawing on um, public choice theory and how it looks at the um, incentives facing uh, actual and potential political actors. Um, now, if I was go on to part one, which is an attempt to assess the success of libertarian strategy, uh, I'm going to briefly run through some of these libertarian strategies that have been tried. So um, there's obviously things like um, education efforts, um, trying to persuade key opinion formers, academia, through things like writing articles, publishing books, TV and radio appearances, social media, and so on and so forth. Another strategy, of course, is party politics. And I mean, does anyone know what's happened to the Libertarian Party in the UK recently? There are several of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think... One of them's got a new leader, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't heard much from them recently. I think it did OK for a while when Chris Mouncey was in charge, but then they had some sort of meltdown. <laughs> Uh, and obviously in America it's still, well, I only guess maybe 1% of the vote or something, but it's more organised there and, and has some, some sway. Um, yeah, there was the entryism entries strategy, you know, trying to get in some sort of weight within, say, the Conservative Party and so on. I think that was going quite well in the 1980s, but then it sort of got stamped down by the party high command. Um, it was tried in the US as well, but judging by the recent presidential debates in the Republican Party, it hasn't really got very far. Um, and even, you know, Rand Paul's completely sold out, basically, on a lot of policies. Um, so the entries on strategy hasn't really worked. Um, it was looking good for the sort of Comkin-esque agorists um, ideas until recently. The idea that you could sort of uh, have a counter-economy, the shadow economy, and bypass, um, bypass taxation and, and big government and eventually become strong enough to challenge the government, challenge the state. Um, you know, think there we've seen a lot of the, the hopes that um, things like Bitcoin and the dark web would enable these kind of initiatives. But it hasn't really worked out too well in that respect. So you saw, you know, a massive state crackdown on the Silk Road and what was his name? Uh, Ul Ross Ulbricht, was it? The, the founder. Um, you know, getting sent down for 300 years or whatever they do in America. Um, and you know, I think there's a realisation that, in a sense, um, a lot of this technology is quite susceptible to, this, to sort of state surveillance and so on, probably more so some of the, than some of the traditional uh, ways of avoiding the authorities. Um, you know, the exit strategy, things like, um, you know, sea setting and so on hasn't really taken off. Um, and libertarians have tended not to indulge in much direct action, you know, and like some of the other groups, like the socialist workers, the animal rights, and the greens, and so on. So there hasn't been much direct action. So we can't really judge whether that has been a success or not. Now, can anyone think of any key strategies that I've missed in that quick list? Um, yeah, it says sea studying. Yeah, yeah, that sort of exit type strategy. Um, I think yeah, there's potential there. We haven't seen much action with that. Um, if some libertarians are in the sort of prepping movement in the States and have disappeared in, into their own little long place in Idaho, but it hasn't really, it hasn't really become a, a mass movement. So, you know, lots of different strategies. Now, it's not easy to sort of find a way of assessing whether these things have been successful or not. So this is going to be kind of a, a bit of a random list of, of indicators. Um, and perhaps we can discuss whether there are better indicators than, than the ones I've sort of picked at random here. Um, so that's a problem in itself, measuring the, the success or failure of any political movement. Um, but there's, there's very, for starters, fundamentally, there's very little evidence of the state shrinking, quite the opposite, in fact. There might be some um, reduction in the state share of GDP sort of post-recession back to the sort of medium-term norm, but, you know, we're still looking at 
knocking around 40 to 45 percent of GDP in, in much of Europe uh, and the UK, compared with under 10 percent for much of the 19th century. Um, big government advocates, uh, they completely dominate the cultural field, the arts and so on, um, comedy, film, etc., etc. There's very little evidence of libertarian influence, one or two exceptions to the rule, but not much at all. Um, <clears throat> now, as far as I know, there's not a single libertarian journalist writing for the national press as a, as a columnist or regular contributor. Um, am, am I wrong about that, or can anyone think of any, any names? A.N. Wilson has called himself a libertarian. Yeah, anarchist is it? And he's sort of is libertarian-ish. Some, there are a few people like that, though, aren't there, who are sort of libertarianish in, in some respect, but not across the board. Simon Jenkins. They call Simon Jenkins. Simon Jenkins. I mean, he's, yeah. he's like Aaron Wilson. Yeah. He's like Aaron Wilson. He'll go to the other extreme, but occasionally he produces a libertarian. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't like planning deregulation, though, does he? Oh, no. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean... Nobody can system. Sorry? Nobody can system. Exactly. I mean, even, there've even been, you know, some of the ones you think are sort of Austrian friendly have, have sort of been a bit weak on things recently. So, I mean, I think that's quite depressing, really, because there are hundreds of these people and not one of them's a libertarian. So, um, your MPs, I mean, this is another one I'll, I'll put out to the audience, but as, as far as I know, there's possibly only one MP who's a, an across the board libertarian. Um, can anyone think of anyone else? Sure, no, I don't want to say who it is, but I'm just. Can oh. anyone think of any names? Well, Steve Davis yeah. claims to be a libertarian. David Davis. No, Steve. 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 Baker. Steve. 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 As far as yeah, as far as I know, across the board. But anyone, can anyone think of anyone else? I mean, David Davis is okay on some things, but not definitely not across the board. Um, so that's one out of 650. And Douglas Coswell as well, I guess, on some things he's a bit Yeah, but he's not, uh, not across the board. He's more, he's kind of a bit of a neocon in some ways. He's quite good on things like monetary policy, you know, seeing all the flaws of uh, um, central banking and so on. So yeah, Douglas is an ally in some ways, but not in others. Um, but yeah, so, but even if you include the people who are sympathetic in a little bit sympathetic, it still doesn't get as very many. So um, that's not good. Um, one out of 650. Uh, <laughs> um, complete absence in the EU institutions, as far as I can tell. One. Who's? Uh, I won't mention his name, but, but there is one of the London MEPs is obviously very sympathetic. He's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Oh. I stand corrected. Uh, if it's who, who, who I think yeah, it is. I'm sure it is. Is yeah. this the ideology that dare not speak its name? Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't expect anyone in Parliament to be a libertarian, though, would you? I wouldn't, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> who is this fellow? Well, I mean, I'm just saying, if it's, I mean, there might, yeah, there might be maybe one of, I mean, uh, Godfrey Bloom was okay on some things, but not on others, so, you know, it was one of those types. Um, yeah, um, there are quite a few of these sort of ordo liberals in the EU institutes, but personally I think they're, you know, anathema to libertarians, that's just another form of state capitalism. But, you know, you, you can have worse people than ordo liberals, I suppose. Um, yeah, no... No libertarian political parties, as far as I know, have any substantial influence in, in Europe and not much influence in the US these days. You know, it was a bit better in the 80s, perhaps. Um, can anyone think, does anyone know of any libertarian parties in, in Europe that are making waves? No, so no seem they're not waving, they're drowning. <laughs> Was that, uh, what's her name? Stevie uh, Smith. Stevie Smith, Smith yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> academia, that's another one. That, that I've, <laughs> um, so it's like, there are a handful, in the UK, there are a handful of libertarian-leaning people at King's College now in their 
one of their departments, was it public policy or something department, like, political economy department. And then there, you know, there are a few, maybe half a dozen scattered around in random, usually sort of second or third rate places because they're, you know, sort of squeezed out of them, the cliques and so on because of their views. Um, Jonathan Barnes at Cambridge. Sorry? Jonathan Barnes at Cambridge. Right, yeah. So, so there is... But he's been yeah. there for some time. Yeah. Yeah, so there are examples, but, you know, there are probably tens of thousands of academics and we're talking about, you know, a couple of dozen at best, probably. You did have Robin Hark at uh, Warwick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's a member of the LA. Yeah, so, I mean, there are there are a few of them scattered around, but and a bit of a... He's scattered around. So he, uh, he died in a... Yeah, <laughs> a plane crash. No, True. <laughs> um, yeah, but not not too many in academia. It's the same same picture. Um, yeah, think think tank world, which I know quite well. Um, you know, there are maybe a handful of proper libertarians in the think tank world, but even in the so-called free market think tanks, they're outnumbered by um, you know, neo liberals and ordo liberals and. Um, neo, a lot of neocons these days as well. Particularly, so that's really been a growth phenomenon. Um, and I, I don't, I don't, you know, I think they're actually the, all those groups are actually enemies of libertarianism in the long run, ideologically. They might be strategic allies in the short term against common enemies, but I think in the longer run, they're, they're actually, you know, this sort of Friedmanites are, are enemies um, of proper libertarians with their um, rigged markets and all the rest of it. Um, yes, yeah, civil society is another another one I noted. Uh, you know, all the charity, charitable sector, NGOs, and so on, and they're you know completely antithetical to uh, libertarianism generally. I mean, unless anyone's got some examples of these NGOs that are sort of libertarian-minded. I mean, part of the problem is a lot of them are funded by the government for starters, or, so that doesn't help. Um, yeah, and. My final point on, on this sort of random list is um, I think we've got to be aware of these um, global economic shifts and the implications of those for libertarianism. So if you think this philosophy has a core in the so-called Anglo-Saxon world and that, that that part of the world is becoming less and less relevant in terms of the um, you know, global economy and, and transnational institutions and so on, I think that's that's also something we've got to watch out for. You know that um, that in itself, these big tides of um, economic geography are working against to some extent, and also you know the shift to the to the east where um, it's just you know libertarianism doesn't have a look in. Um, also, you know the demographic tides as well working against us. Um, so now the you know a less a less thoughtful audience would say, you know, what about Thatcher and Reagan? You know, didn't we have a big success story with them? Um, of course, if you look at even the, uh, the basics, things like, you know, share of state spending and GDP, so Thatcher managed a bit of a, a plateauing for a few years, maybe went down a little bit by one or two percentage points, and then once major coin, it went back up again. Uh, I think Reagan, if anything, increased government spending certainly increased the, the debt level um, and also he, he launched things like the war on drugs which was an, you know absolutely abhorrent well he didn't launch it, it was Nixon wasn't he but he intensified it it was an absolutely abhorrent um, crackdown on, on liberty um, and also the you know the Central American death squads Pol Pot all this stuff people never talk about Reagan um, targeting the Saddam's chemical weapons against Iran, that sort of stuff. So it's, you know, it's definitely you know, a bad side to Reagan, to say the least. Um, you know, what about privatisation? That was supposedly somewhere where we had a, a big influence. And I think, unfortunately, um, libertarians to some extent played the role of useful idiots here because um, what we wanted was um, proper privatisation to move away from direct state control to actual free markets. But what we actually got was um, a move to, if you like, um, artificial uh, rigged markets, um, heavily regulated, um, 
And I think in some senses, at least, it's probably more akin to crony capitalism than what we actually wanted. So, and he also didn't really get the... You got some efficiency gains in some sectors, but in a lot of sectors, I think you probably got the opposite because you all this regulation and cronyism and um, you know special interest uh, trying to, to um, cash in on the on the regulatory structure. It's called you know regulatory capture and um, Stigler's theory on this. Um, you actually ended up with more more regulation and more transaction costs and. Uh, more rent seeking than you did under the nationalisation, in, not in every sector, but in some sectors at least. And, and that's partly the other problem, of course, is some of these big utilities are naturally, uh, there are huge economies of scale and they're naturally vertically integrated, in which case there, there's already a lot of, um, the, within those companies, there's already a lot of command economy going on. So the benefits of moving those to the private sector are probably lower than from things like retail and distribution, the more dynamic entrepreneurial uh, fragmented sectors, um, which of course is partly what the communists realized with the, the new economic policy and then um, Deng Xiaoping in China, his version of it, which was, um, what was his thing called? Um, well, the no, it's, no it's the, um, was it socialism the Chinese way or something, his, his version of the new economic policy. So I think, you know, it's a, a bit of a red herring to see um, Thatcher and Reagan is a big success story for the libertarian movement. The other key example, of course, is the, the um, so-called deregulation of the city, the Big Bang. But actually what it was was destroying the private regulation that already existed and replacing it with um, state regulation that also had the crony capitalist element in the sense it let in these uh, crony capitalist US investment banks into the frame. So. That wasn't really about, I mean, that's a good example of what Thatcherism and Reaganism actually delivered in, in, in reality. It was, uh, it, we didn't get genuine privatisation, a genuine free market. We just got a shift from effectively state capitalism model A to state capitalism model B. And whether, whether that was more efficient depends a lot on the sector. Um, yeah, and also I, I mentioned briefly the prospects for agorism. Um, hopes for cryptocurrencies and so on, but we also find that a lot of these key internet hubs are hand in glove with governments now, and you know engaged in all the mass surveillance programs. Um, if you look at the counter economy as a whole, if we say look at the shadow economy, the stats seem to show it's actually shrinking in the West now. And I think part of the reason is um, all this uh, new technology and mass surveillance things. You know, the tax collectors are now linking up all their databases and cracking down, it's cheaper for them to crack down on more people. Um, and they're gradually, you know, they started off with very rich people and they're gradually getting right down to, you know, even people selling stuff on eBay and now being you know, monitored by the HMRC or whatever. So it's actually getting harder for the shadow economy to thrive. You also have the war on cash as well. Places like Sweden have almost abolished cash, which is making it harder for the shadow economy to work. Obviously it can still work using other substitutes, but it's, that creates transaction costs in itself and, and will tend to, um, all things being equal, tend to cause it to decline. So even agorism isn't looking good. Yeah, and another aspect of that is um, you, another possible hope was um, that there were still some stateless societies around the world, some places where there was effectively no state, whether Maybe nominally there was a state, but in fact there wasn't uh, in any functioning sense. You know, places like Somalia for a while, um, Azawad in northern Mali, um, obviously places like Papua New Guinea, Zomia in Southeast Asia, places like that. And yeah, you know, there might have been a hope that these could have been, a, if you like, a, a um, springboard for a sort of stateless institutions to at least move, to expand somewhat spatially and also to act as a safety valve of refuge for people who were trying to flee the state. Um, another example would be Afghan parts of Afghanistan that had no real central authority. But of course, all these places are now you know, come under attack by, by various um, sort of massive power blocks. Um, foreign aids gradually uh, sort of being used to register all these people in these places with biometric IDs and putting in new roads and you know, steal, being used to steal the land and destroying all these, gradually destroying these stateless societies. 
So even that's looking looking pretty bad. Um, you know, that sort of safety valve is gradually being eroded by by um, big governments and its expansionary plans in the developing world. Now, um, yeah, there are some bright spots. Um, I think the libertarian student movement has been growing very rapidly, but there's a, a bit of a caution, a sort of cautionary note here. Um, you know, a lot of these young people, they might have kind of a strong uh, ideological viewpoint now, but you know, once they get into into governments or they get influential jobs, they're very likely to sell out, and we've seen that time and time again. You know, career ambition and so on will tend to dilute it. And also, I think it's a problem in the sense that um, the sort of non-libertarian, um, sort of the sort of neoliberal stroke pretend libertarian types have kind of captured a lot of the the student movement and are leading them astray. Um, so you find that usually at these sort of student conferences that are supposedly libertarian, you'll have you perhaps have one properly libertarian speaker, and then you'll have you know, the other nine will be neoliberal, sort of Milton Friedmanized rather than David Friedmanized, if you can put it that way. Um, and also, you know, ne ne a few neocons usually as well. So um, it's, you know, partic particularly a big problem in Europe that and a lot of these libertarian student conferences in Europe are actually funded by the EU or the US government or the German government, which says a lot. And obviously, they're not going to come out with anything that, that challenges the establishment if they're, they're getting their money from there. Right, so that's the end of part one. So a few bright spots, but, but generally, you know, I think people were a lot more optimistic a few years ago before all this sort of, we've seen sort of a, another sort of upsurge in big government over the last couple of years. Uh, and particularly depressing that it's, uh, you know, a conservative government that's doing it uh, at the moment. Um, not that you know, we should expect anything else <laughs> looking from experience. Um, so now I'm going to move on to some of the possible explanations, some of the, if you like, structural problems facing the libertarian movement. Um, and I'm going to use the lens of public choice theory. I'm not going to ex you know, go into public choice theory too much. Um, but um, yeah, one of the key insights is the, um, the logic of collective action by Mansur Olson. Uh, and that's the observation that um, concentrated special interest groups who have, have very strong incentives to um, engage in political action because they're going to gain financially from, for example, rigging regulation or getting subsidies from the government. Um, and this contrasts with uh, dispersed groups like taxpayers or consumers um, that have very low incentives to um, get involved in political action, to lobby, to try and rent seat because the um, gains to any individual of those groups are so low that it's just not worth the bother of them even finding out about political issues. And so if you think, think of concentrated special interests, there might be things like you know, a particular industry where there's a few big firms who want to get protectionism or subsidies or favourable regulation. Or it could be a bureaucracy, you know, a central government bureaucracy that wants to see their budgets increased and more status and so on and so forth. And, and my sort of basic hypothesis is that, that libertarianism f faces a particularly hard struggle vis-a-vis -vis other political movements because it runs against these concentrated special interests and it doesn't re its in own interests don't really coincide with any of these concentrated special interests which means that it really have to reach much higher bar to have any sign significant influence over policy or indeed the erosion of policy. Now, um, I can explain how this could work by looking at a movement that has been successful over the past 30 or 40 years, which is um, environmentalism. And it, it, in a sense, it has a similar sort of long-term timeline to libertarianism. You know, it became sort of the seeds really grew in the... The seeds go back way back like libertarianism, but it really sort of started to grow a lot in the 1960s. And then... Um, but by contrast to libertarianism, by the late 1980s, it was starting to permeate um, policy, and now it, it pretty much permeates um, just about everything that the government does. Um, obviously, the radical environmentalists will complain that it hasn't gone far enough, but nonetheless, you know, you, you can argue that it's you know, had immense influence over everything, and just about every government department's permeated by uh, you know environmental policies now. Um, now. 
how can we explain this compared with uh, libertarianism? Um, for one, environmentalism offered ample opportunities for uh, bureaucratic expansion, for um, new institutions, for bureaucratic growth. And that was particularly important uh, at the end of the Cold War when, um, if you like, to some extent, big governments have been um, delegitimized, uh, wasn't popular, so they could latch onto this, if you like, new form, new excuse for big government in environmentalism. It's particularly important for transnational bureaucracies like the UN and the uh, European Union because uh, they, of course, um, these um, environmental problems can be viewed as global or re you know, regional problems beyond just nation states. So th it was absolutely fantastic news for them. They could justify all kinds of uh, growth in their transnational institutions. It could also be exploited by crony capitalist corporations. So you know, some of these car firms, for example, they use environmental regulation, which we know from VW, you know, the extent to which it's, they managed to capture the policy makers. I mean, personally, I think it's a you know, good thing if those regulations are watered down, but that just, it just shows this close relationship between the people that write the regulations and the people that are supposed to comply with them, this regulatory capture again. Um, yeah, so it could be exploited by them to shut out um, competition from developing countries. It's, if you like, a new work form of protectionism. Um, like the ozone layer thing, uh, that meant they had to use expensive high-tech refrigerants with, that were patented as well in the West and not the you know, bog standard CFCs. So that was great for the for Western companies. All these you know, uh, anti-pollution technologies in cars as well. In India, they, they sell the Tata Nano car for about 1,500 quid, um, brand new. But to me, to comply with the EU regulations, they'd have to sell it for about seven grand here, which just shows how these regulations are, are a form of protectionism. Um, yeah, and also, you know, these um, very powerful cro crony capitalists, what, what Lenin called the financial oligarchy, uh, they, of course, see the, the potential for skimming huge rents from emissions trading and all these uh, phony environmental markets. So they've already got a massive uh, sulfur trading scheme in the, in the US uh, run out of Chicago. But if it moves on to carbon trading, which we already have a bit of with the EU scheme, but if you get some sort of wholesale carbon trading thing here, they're going to be able to skim a fortune out of environmentalism. So these very powerful vested interests align with environmentalists' own views, which gives them a massive leg up in terms of getting their, their policy implemented. So, yeah, my basic idea is that you know, libertarianism faces an uphill struggle because its objectives don't coincide with those of concentrated uh, special interests. The main beneficiaries from uh, freed markets and libertarian um, policies or removing government policies uh, would be um, dispersed interests like consumers and taxpayers who find it very difficult to organise directly. Um, now, there's also a problem within the libertarian movement, which is that phony libertarianism, the sort of Friedmanite neoliberalism, that actually does benefit these powerful special, concentrated special interests because it creates artificial rigged markets that can be exploited by these, if you like, crony capitalist interests. Something like education vouchers would be a prime example where there would be, you'd have to, obviously there'd be you know, tight government regulations to stop you know, Islamic State running schools and getting their uh, government subsidies from the vouchers or whatever, like we saw with the, you know, the Birmingham uh, scandal. Um, so, you know, these Friedmanite schemes offer massive opportunities for these firms to shape regulation um, and make money from it. So you can see uh, there's a tension here within the libertarian movement that, um, if you like, the Friedmanites, um, neoliberals will tend to get policy traction, whereas the libertarian, proper libertarians won't because of this um, special interest, pattern of special interest uh, groups. Um, so you find that also affects the funding of libertarian groups as well. So the, the phony neoliberal groups will tend to get much more funding because they serve the special, concentrated special interests. So we see you know, genuine libertarian groups really struggle to get any funding. A good example is um, Centre for a Stateless Society. <laughs> uh, I'm coming on to the Libertarian Alliance in a minute. Yeah. Um, and, 
Yeah, that's the uh, leading left libertarian think tank in the States, um, with people like Kevin Carlson writing for them. And, um, you know, I don't agree with a lot of what Kevin writes, um, though it's definitely worth reading. But, you know, I don't think it's right that he's, you know, working as a, whatever, is a hospital orderly or something, shoving trolleys around. And that also, you know, um, getting, you know, a few quid, a few hundred dollars a month from a few private donors. But, you know, he should be, you'd think, on a life for life basis, he would be a, you know, a professor somewhere or in some major institute, given all the work he's done. Um, but once again, the, you know, the li left libertarians really are, they're really screwed because if any bunch is sort of counter all these powerful concentrated special interests, it's them. You know, even the, um, probably the tobacco industry don't lie them because they're anti-IP and all the rest of it and trademarks. So um, they're, they're really in trouble. Yeah, I mean, the Li Libertarian Alliance, um, uh, you know, current venue notwithstanding isn't the best funded organisation in the world. Um, I think the other one's, you know, a pretty shoestring operation as well. Um, I think the only, only possible exception is the Mises Institute that, that has a few wealthy... Um, donors, once again, you know, I don't agree with everything that they sort of push, but nonetheless, they're definitely in the, the you know, pretty hardcore libertarian camp. And um, I think maybe, you know, maybe in a sort of big market like the States, there's room for one such organisation. But, you know, I'm not seeing a, a massive number of potential donors in this country who would fund a, a properly libertarian organisation. Or at least, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I don't know about them. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's this problem within the libertarian movement that it, it then becomes uh, there, be, there are strong financial incentives to um, sell out and move towards the sort of Friedmanite like neoliberalism rather than proper libertarianism. And it's not just the matter of the donations. Um, it's also, as I mentioned before, if there are no libertarians libertarian sort of journalists in the mainstream media then obviously um whereas there are quite a lot of these sort of neoliberal types obviously um if you want to get press coverage um you're likely to do better if you're one of those neoliberals rather than the libertarian um so, and at the same time if you get the press coverage and then you'll tend to get more donations so it becomes like a, a vicious circle that pushes you towards selling out and we can you know see that with some of the major u.s think tanks i think um, you know, I think they do a lot of great work, but you know, sort of people like Rothbard were, were gradually pushed out of the, if you like, the uh, mainstream U.S. Um, so-called libertarian think tanks, and that's quite telling. And um, it's only really, you know, there are a few sort of places they can still still reside in, but definitely, um, if you like, the Beltway think tanks in Washington D.C. Are, are very compromised indeed, and dominated by. Um, neoliberals with a few uh, neocons thrown in there as well and um, there's also the the problem that they have to sort of be seen to have political influence as well or the places to get the dona donations and the media coverage and so there's a tendency to try and um, sort of get close to politicians even though they're completely unlibertarian so there is I'm not going to name any names but there are, you know some supposedly libertarian think tanks in the UK started uh, chumming up to Tony Blair in the late 90s, for example, even though you know, what he was doing was completely against libertarian principles on the whole. And in Europe, and every, you think things are bad in the States and the UK, but in Europe it's so bad that um, a lot of these self-described libertarian and free market groups are actually funded by governments, and some of them are actually seed funded by US foreign aid. I mean, how hypocritical is that? We like bang on about foreign aid being a terrible thing. And some of these so-called libertarian groups in Eastern Europe actually was pretty much founded by the American government and got seed funding from, from US aid. And then they sort of got handed over to these big US foundations eventually, some of them, so they maybe take a bit less state funding now. But a lot of them get money from the EU and the um, German government as well. And then it's no surprise that suddenly the European Union, that to a genuine libertarian, will tend to be viewed as some terrible big government you know, sort of monstrosity, Leviathan type thing. But mysteriously, all these um, so-called libertarian groups in Eastern Europe really love the European Union. You know, it doesn't take much to figure out why, really. 
Um, yeah, so to conclude, um, you know, the um, non-libertarians within the wider movement and, and sellouts have a huge um, advantage over general libertarians because they their views tally with the special interests and therefore they tend to get the breaks in terms of donations, the media coverage, um, influence with politicians. Or it's like maybe a sham influence, the idea that at least you're engaging with them. Um, but, you know, um, whereas say left libertarians would be completely beyond the pale for, for most politicians. Um, and this in, enhances the tendency for compromise, and it means that genuine libertarian ideas actually tend not to get anywhere. Um, and you know, a recent example is um, the infiltration or growth of neoconservatism within the wider free market and libertarian movement with more and more um, think tanks and organisations being, if not taken over, but very heavily influenced by the, the neoconservatives, which of course originally was uh, came out of Trotskyism and believes in things like social cohesion and massive foreign intervention, um, wealth, you know, believes in a welfare state and lots of kind of things like censorship and state surveillance. It's hard to pin it down, but you can you know, pretty much judge them by their actions rather than what they actually write a lot of the time. Um, and what you see is that um, you know there are a lot of these neocons in the Conservative Party, uh, there are lots of, an awful lot of them in the media, and then they'll tend to give other neocons in, in the NGOs and so on the breaks, the, you know, the newspaper columns, the opportunities, the media appearances. So if you like, it becomes a virtuous circle for them, but at the same time, that's crowding out genuine libertarians, you know, you know, lead to you know, good things for their careers and promotions and so on. Um, so there's a tendency within the libertarian movement for it to, to sort of sell out to these non-libertarian ideologies. Right, so I'm going to finish by opening up the debate with a few questions. Um, so am I correct that libertarianism faces particularly high hurdles uh, because, it, because of this logic of collective action and because it doesn't, its interests don't coincide with those of concentrated special interests? Is it true that few, if any, concentrated li special interests have common cause with libertarians or rather some that I haven't thought of that could have common cause? Is there some untapped source of funding for genuine libertarian groups that we don't know about or I haven't mentioned? And if these uh, conclusions that I made are accurate, I mean, what are the implications for libertarian strategy going forward? Does it mean we've somehow been going wrong and we should adjust our strategy in a different direction? I'll end it there. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Very interesting. I agree with a lot of what you said about politics. Uh, you basically paint a very uh, negative t picture of, of libertarianism and politics. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have long given up on, on, on basically playing the, the political game. I think you can't win there. But um, I am actually quite optimistic on... Uh, on, on other grounds, I, I think the ideas are spreading, and uh, we, we are seeing more and more alternatives by the market being set up, even if, uh, if you know, of course, the, the state tries to, to fight back. Yeah. That doesn't mean we have, uh, we have, we have, we have lost the war. We, we might have lost a battle or two, but uh, we, we might still win the war, because uh, all this surveillance, what, what's going on, for example, I think we will find technological... Um, uh, technology that, that will uh, make it very difficult for them, even with all the infrastructure in place, to surveil people who don't want to be surveilled. I mean, of course, you will always have to actively take the decision, I don't want to be surveilled. But if, if you have something to hide or whatever, and you have that technology in place, that would be good enough. Because, uh, I mean, mm. that you're posting what you had for dinner last, last night, that the government is surveilling that or whatever. It's not, it's not really much of a, of a problem. They don't care, and it's, it's, not, it's, it's of no importance. So I'm actually quite, a, I'm actually long term quite optimistic because the internet and, and this technology clearly spreads our ideas very well without having to have these think tanks that are funded very well because everyone can just write blog posts for, for almost nothing essentially. And, and they are read by, 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 by more and more people, I think. Are they actually read by that many people though? 
what but more, more people. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with you, but on the technology side of things, I mean, a lot of the problem is a lot of these ways of hiding from the authorities, like Tor, for example, I believe was actually a government um, instigated mechanism with their, all the back doors attached to it and so on and so forth. Um, that I think it was uh, Kevin Dowd that revealed that in a recent recent book, but obviously it wasn't it didn't come from him originally. But um, yeah, so there's, there's obviously a danger that they they'll actually the governments will be sneakier and they'll have a lot of the, the sort of encryption technology and so on will come from them. So they've got you know the back doors to it all. That's a danger, and it is very difficult you know to sort of um, hide what you're doing online because there's so many sort of tells. Um, so I, I think. You know, I hear what you're saying, but I think you know, so I'm not convinced it's going to be sort of a transformative change anyway. Um, yeah, the coordination problems of getting the movement together have been brought down by, by the internet, and lots, lots more people have been exposed to the idea. But as I said, I think the initial sort of advantage we had has, has dissipated now as other groups are now using similar, similar methods. So it's not clear that you know, why libertarians would be more successful at using that top technology than, than other groups. Because we're better arguments, mm-hmm. but then then there's going from that there's going from that point to then actually getting getting sort of real concrete action, which is difficult. That's where you probably you could you know you could have a wider wider spread of the ideas, but then come up against these institutional barriers to just not getting past there. But yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not as depressed as the sort of the talk makes out. But <laughs> I think it's important to sort of make these make these um, views clear. John. Uh, I think we might be looking for success at the sort of level that you might expect to find it in a, quite a mature ideology. But libertarianism, uh, even if we regard it as you know, reborn classical liberalism, uh, has only been around for a few decades. And uh, I've seen an incredible growth in it at a grassroots level. And that's where. I would expect to see most of the growth, and, I, and uh, I think that is where I see growth. Nowadays, you can't go to a pub without mentioning libertarianism, and somebody else is libertarian. <laughs> no, a few decades ago, uh, you could get just about all the libertarians in London into this room. Um, are, are, are they actually libertarians, or are they just? Do they just think they are? Um, oh, at the time, are you really talking about now or then? No, I mean now. Now, in, because well, there, uh, there was a lot of confusion. Always, there always was, a, mm. a, you know, a range of people who, uh, you know, actually knew what they were talking about. People, uh, less so. Uh, but one example of um, the growth of the movement is, is a, a girl came here a couple of uh, years ago. She said, "Well, I've never heard of libertarianism. I've never heard of you." You're, you're clearly making no progress whatsoever. Uh, you know, you've got a chat and I, so I thought, well, we're a meetup group. But, so I did a quick Google on meetup groups uh, worldwide. And I'll give you a, 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 a couple of figures here. Socialist meetup groups worldwide, I'll round these figures, uh, 70 to 10,000 members. Feminist meetup groups, 300, uh, 60,000 members. Conservative meetup groups, 400, 75,000 members. Libertarian meetup groups, uh, over 450, 80,000 members. We're streets ahead of socialists and mm. feminists. To be beating the conservatives is utterly remarkable. I could, I could hardly read the figures myself on it. 464 meetup groups. Now, this is grassroots stuff, and you know, that's at this stage what I'd still expect. But that seems to show there's something very real and growing. And uh, I can't believe that you know, this doesn't this this counts for nothing. Or that's this is just uh, foam, uh, ideological foam, and will just blow away. Yeah, I think that's Ryan. I mean, another point. I'm not, you know, not going to question that. But another point would be that um, the sort of at least um, sort of presence of the libertarian viewpoint 
is there even if it's in a minority and it's sort of questions the usual sort of consensus. People know what it is now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Now, it's now an insult. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, I agree with you. And and I think you, I think I also agree that, you know, possibly looking not really not really acknowledging that it is relatively young movement and so you know we shouldn't expect too much from it at this stage. Nonetheless, I don't think that detracts from some of these uh, problems with the logic of collective action that the terrorism face. So it means it has to go you know, reach a higher bar to get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Detlev and then Bob and then. Is it Zen. Zen. So Detlev, Bob, and then. Uh, yeah, Richard, maybe uh, allow me maybe a, a critical comment. I mean, I, I could say for someone who is a libertarian, you seem to be a bit of tr distrustful of uh, the market for opinion or the you know public, you know the public's perception, because you know when it comes to the little uptake of libertarian ideas by the broader public, you seem to blame special interest groups and pressure groups and, and, and other organizational hurdles. But maybe it's just the public. You know, maybe the product we have to offer is just not one that the public really desires so much, or that is not such a priority for public one. I mean, there's a market out there. So I would say, in my own limited experience in meeting journalists, and when I sort of was promoting libertarian ideas and the free field of money, I don't think that these people are institutionally opposed to it. They just know their audience, and they just know what kind of ideas and what kind of uh, uh, viewpoints chime in the audience. So I, I think picking up on maybe John's points earlier, I think either you can see libertarianism as some sort of avant-garde ideology that is uh, really going to grow uh, into maybe a political influential movement, maybe over the next hundred years. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe you are like a 16th century or 17th century philosopher who, you know, whose ideas really are going to be put into practice you know, long after his death. Or you think you are operating in the world of real today politics, but then you have to speak to the men in the street and to the common people, and things like, quite frankly, the scale of the surveillance state, 90% of the population doesn't care. You know, they happily use their Googles, they happily know that their data is going to be restored, and it's just not a key concern for this. And just make that move to, and sometimes I wonder, and I do think, I'm more optimistic than you, I do think that libertarian ideas are spreading just very differently, very slowly, and sometimes through compromises. So I think coming back to Milton Friedman, yes, he may not epitomize your idea of pure libertarian theory, but in the 70s, he was instrumental in getting rid of the draft in the United States. Now, that was something. Yeah, that's, it, that's it, about the only thing I agree well, with. But, but, that, on, yeah. but that was, a, that was, I would say, was a, a, <laughs> yeah, a huge thing. idea. It's a huge thing, yeah. It did shine yeah. with the public, yeah. and yeah. the public did care about the draft and getting rid of it, and it was a success. And it was a small step, but that's how politics works. Mm -hmm. So I think either you're in the field of pure ideology, which you, you will have to uh, admit that you will not have in, influence in, in your own lifetime, uh, but maybe uh, in the long run your ideas will resonate. Or you're in the field of politics, which is something where you have to be in the market for opinion, and that's very different from the pure libertarian theory. Yeah, no, I think some, some good points there, in fact, very good points. Um, with the, um, on the issue of the media, though, um, we saw the recent scandal with um, you know, stories being pulled because it would upset, upset the ad certain advertisers. So that's one issue there. You know, there is a direct influence in, from these special interests on media content. And I think often, unfortunately, libertarians are just used as uh, useful idiots uh, by the media and politicians in the sense that um, you know they'll they'll libertarians will come out with a sort of sort of radical privatisation plan. And then the politicians and the sort of influential journalists that will then promote something that doesn't seem so extreme and seems more reasonable. There's the crony capitalist option, and then that's exactly what actually gets put into place. So, um, I mean, and I think as far as you know, the, the public are concerned, uh, if you look at environmentalism, I mean, that was entirely a sort of top down thing from the um, elites. I mean, it wasn't as if people could notice um, you know, climate change or so on in, in the 1980s. It all came down from these you know, big institutions and politicians and bureaucracies and so on. And if you like, um, you know, the public awareness came from this propaganda from these, uh, in, these organizations, these special interests. It wasn't like there was a market there. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't a genuine sort of choice 
that people made based on their own experiences. It was very much from the outside, a top-down process, and I think that's generally true for a lot of policy trends, just because of these public choice type incentive structures that apply to the media as well. Bob? Uh, to look on the bright side, if things become very, very bad, as they may in the next 10, 20 years, it's libertarians who can explain why they went bad. Very bad. Pension, spending, uh, what do they call it in America? What, what you owe the public. Yeah. Well, they aren't going to meet them. They aren't going to do it. They ain't going to do it no how, no way. Now, who who conned them? Who lied to them? Who screwed it up all those years? And who's explained why it can never work? That make up for something. But, but don't you think that the, the sort of mainstream narrative is that it was you know free markets that messed up the economy? You know. Banks on that, the loose. That, that, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. In the short run, in the short run, yes. Yeah. But um, if this is happening yeah, I suppose, 10, 15 years down the line. Yeah, I suppose if you have a sort of an arbonomics type situation where you know, the intervention fails again and again and again. And the public, uh, yeah. you know, the retired population is getting larger, the tax yeah. population is getting smaller. Than, you know. No, I think that's right. And also, also you know, the, the sort of um, great move of the, the economic course of the East is going to come as a shock to the system at some point in the next couple of decades as well. So, you know, whether I think particularly when the um, all the sort of rentier scams that the West engages in uh, come a cropper as political and military power collapses, you know, things like you know, creaming off money from the Gulf states and that kind of thing, um, and then there'll be a you know, big ratchet down in living standards um, once all those scams um, it doesn't collapse. guarantee success, but no. it's an opportunity. So. No, no, I agree with that, yeah. yeah. But it, it obviously it's a danger it could go in mm. this sort of, sort of Corbynomics type yeah. direction. Mm. Mm. Then? Uh, let's see what you think of this. I, when I try and convince people of libertarian or, in my case, like anarcho capitalist mm. tenants, uh, most people believe that, even if it's true or not, that they have some sort of skin in this game called statism. And corporations love, big corporations love the state for the protections they provide. Unions love the state for the monopoly privileges that they provide. So when you try to convince these people against the, um, all the state that does wrong, you know, it, it's hard to do so when they believe that they can get something out of the game as it is played now. And then to be a true libertarian, from an ethical perspective, you, you cannot allow yourself to play the game, and that's sort of the catch-22 that we find ourselves in. You can't win the game if you don't play. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it, to be honest. Um, and it, but I think um, it kind of it gives us some clues as to um, strategy in terms of if we ever did get sort of the reins of, of public policy, in the sense that um, you, you wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily do things like... Um, kill off the NHS or, or kill off welfare benefits as the first thing you do. First you'd get rid of some of these regulations and so forth um, that push up the cost of living, the planning system, things like that. So people, if you like, would be compensated for the liberalisation first before you sort of, sort of cut away their, their skin in the game as it were. So I think that, I think it, that has important implications in terms of policy strategy as well as the, the general observation. Anyone else? Uh, oh, yes. Um, yeah, I have a comment on a question. The comment is related to the youth of the libertarian movement, and perhaps for that we don't have enough institutions trying out different strategies. But I think there are a couple of trade-offs that have been put forward. One is between quality and quantity, especially in the student movements that uh, I think that now SFL, for example, that, which is, I think, the biggest one, is really more prone into quantity than into quality, but we don't know if that's the right way or maybe somebody, somebody some other institution should try it in another different way. And between the long run and the short run, because uh, I don't, I'm, I'm Friedman improved the quality of life of tons of people who didn't get drafted, but maybe in the long run, from the libertarian perspective, we wanted the state to look as it is, and the state wants you to go and fight a foreign uh, war and they die. And eventually, in the long run, that may have helped the libertarian cause much more. 
So I think that the, the problem is that we don't have enough institutions trying out different strategies with these trade-offs to see what works better or not. But my question was, uh, maybe a strategy that can advance libertarianism is to capture uh, some other institutions with big funding, like broad liberal or institutions concerned about debates or, or more neutral institutions. In, in my case, from Mexico City, for example, we kind of hijacked an organization that a couple of years ago was giving awards to Gorbachev and Backlog Clubs. And this year, we got it to give it to Ron Paul, for example. So there may be some funding in some more neutral organizations, some philanthropic uh, enterprises that are not politically charged. Maybe we can you know, infiltrate ourselves into them and make them work in our favor. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. But you, I mean, obviously, there's a danger if um, that you're going to lose the sort of funders from year to year. But, year to year, but there, there are some institutions that have got like an endowment on them. So uh, you know, if you could capture them, then. Uh, providing you're broadly within the remit of the, the you know, uh, constitution or whatever, then you, you could actually make a difference and even use it to fund smaller libertarian groups. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea, but these things are often you know, easier said than done to try and take over these institutions. Because they're, they're often de de deliberately designed to be quite, have a high degree of inertia. And so, you know, they might only change you know, one trustee every five years or the, that sort of thing. So it can be hard hard to do, do this quickly and it, you'd have to be really, really committed to to achieve that. But having said that, the you know the sort of Fabian types have managed to do that to subvert various institutions over the, over a very long game. So it is possible. David? Richard, uh, do you think there's a, a difference between the prospects for liberty the prospects for libertarian propaganda making any difference to the prospects for <laughs> Because sometimes I think, well, if, if you could easily in, envisage a situation where the world becomes a much freer place, even though we played no part in that. So I'm just, how yeah. do you see the two? Are they the same thing, or, or, or are the obstacles to one, not necessarily the same. Are, are, we, the obstacles are we an epic phenomenon? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's a great point, and of course you could have yeah, more liberty without libertarians at all, and it could be things like technological change, Correlation, for example. correlation. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, may, maybe we could all be a bit optimistic now, because we've been thinking it might just happen by accident. So. <laughs> well, I mean, alternatively, do you think that, for example, the public choice obstacles to libertarian action are equally obstacles to the advance of liberty? Um, not necessarily, because it, yeah, it could be things like just sort of organic cultural change, some new technology that that sort of, I mean, it could even be you know, something that sort of changes um, uh, you know, land use patterns or population density, and all these things can have an impact on on the degrees of liberty and so on and so forth. So, so the prospects could be bright even though we're wasting our time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but you know, it doesn't mean to say that you know we we can't have some impact as well. So, yeah, good, good very, very good point. Yeah. Seth, you're Seth, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, Richard, um, long time not seen. I'm not seeing that. I'm in the I don't know if you're. Just a bit but um, is it not the case that we win an argument by argument as libertarians, and that can eventually end something greater? I mean, I have to always take that example of foreign policy. Um, I like to think that most people in the UK um, and US and foreign to other countries are less interventionists, because they've seen the trouble that it's caused. And most people aren't libertarians, but they don't believe in us getting involved in Emirates and Syria, let alone Iraq. Um, so, um, are we not, have we not got a um, fine argument that we can relate to first in order for us to get it work? Sometimes I feel as a libertarianism, a lot of people feel it doesn't relate to them. Um, so, um, I was reading an article on libertarianism.org, I don't know if you're familiar with the website, and um, it was about um, civil rights movement in the 60s. And the guy who wrote the article said that um, libertarianism forgets sometimes the experience of minorities. So, sort of black people, maybe in this case Muslims, etc. 
Um, so have we got to sort of be able to, how should I put it, relate to people's lives more in order for it to actually people to take notice? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, that is a problem. And um, if you like, there's this uh, intellectualism within the libertarian movement. Uh, I mean, we could do with more people who are sort of dimming things down and getting some very simple messages across. I'm the man. <laughs> so, um, and, yeah, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure how, how he's able to do this, but uh, yeah, I mean, um, it possibly has improved with things like social media, where, where just by the nature of the medium, you have to condense things and, and dumb them down and, and try and make them as engaging as possible to a, a wide audience. So I think there's some some traction there. But you know, once again, we're going to be hamstrung by um, these concentrated special interests that are, you know, in the media and um, NGOs. Um, Politicians, politics, and so on. So, um, you know, even if even if we get some traction with the general public, then it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate into that much. But, I mean, there are there are things like, for example, jury nullification where it could make a difference, and, and, and things like that. But you know, there's not much evidence that's made much difference so far. Bob, uh, it's possible to have a dispersed uh, special interest group that can concentrate, which is uh, gay live that kind of. Approach. So it was in the personal interest of those who wanted um, things to be legal, or not illegal. That's the same, not the same thing. Um, and that seemed to work. Of course, it was pushing in some ways on an open door. Uh, but um, we can see how that was not everybody arguing in the same way. Not taken up by well, not taken up by politicians that quick. That was a bit of a hot topic. And yet, partly because it was part of the liberal package. So it couldn't really, in a sense, be denied. John Stuart Mill and all that. But um, you know, it, it did it did work from the grassroots up, I think. Yeah, it did. But I but, won't say yeah. bottom up. <laughs> yeah, we could we could, we could do a few of these, couldn't we? <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm not I'm not convinced it was that much of a dispersed special interest in the sense that in these big cities, there's actually quite a tightly knit community, mm-hmm. you know, where people could be sent to Coventry, you know, the free rider problem probably could be addressed because they kind of all pretty much all knew each other and, you know, these sort of social bonds that you wouldn't necessarily get. I mean, that's another problem with, with libertarians tend to very much go their own way and be you know, very, very individual in themselves. So, whereas um, with some of the, um, I don't know how to describe them, sort of egalitarian, more egalitarian groups, they... Uh, they see um, sort of solidarity within the group as being such a big thing, and that I think creates more disincentives to free riding and and gives them advance, an advantage in terms of collective action. But yeah, let's say I think I think the problem with your hypothesis is I don't think it was really a dispersed interest. I think at the core of it was a quite a close, tightly knit community. And there was a commercial interest as well. To, you know, well yeah, plus yeah, you know, sort of the industry as well. Um, and I mean, didn't he get quite a bit of state funding at some oh. point? But that maybe that came a bit later on. But yeah. it does now. It's ne- nearly all state yeah. funded now. Oh. The you know the uh, what's the name of the main one? Stonewall is it? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's government funded. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it did. It did sort of meet um, sort of some bureaucratic uh, criteria. But I think the obviously I think that's that came a bit later in, in the early. But it got support from things like the GLC, didn't it as well? And. Yeah. yeah, so there was quite a bit of state involvement with that. Mm. Hey, speaker, David, do you want to speak? Uh, well, you I put just, your hand uh, up or you just... You, you put a question to us and I, I, uh, towards the end, and I don't know what the answer is, but I'm curious to know your views as to the value of single-issue strategic alliances, uh, for example, uh, drug legalisation. Do you see that as a, a promising route for, uh, first of all, <laughs> achieving some steps towards liberty and, and secondly spreading libertarian ideas. Yeah, I think that there's a, a major um, useful idiot danger with drug legalisation as with privatisations. So you would want, we would want you know, proper legalisation, but what you would get would be um, you know, heavy regulation and crony capitalism uh, with... Um, 
I mean, the question is, I mean, maybe we could exploit the crony capitalists to get some money out of them, though, in the, in the sort of short to medium term to campaign for this sort of thing, and then, and then you know, um, disperse that to, to other libertarian causes. I mean, I think it's probably one of those cases where it would be a good thing anyway, even though it's, you know, legal, legal but crony capitalists would be better than the current situation, as it was with some of the privatisations, but not all. Um, yeah, because it's going to be, you know, it's going to be these big, big companies that have trademarked the brands, and they're going to want quite a lot of regulation to make sure, you know, you can't just get it yourself from the Rift Mountains or whatever. John, uh, I don't know how necessary it is going to be to appeal to people's self-interest in any very short-term or even very long-term way in order to convert them to an ideology. Uh, some ideologies seem to be able to get people to blow themselves up, which uh, some people might think is not very good for them. Uh, so uh, uh, you can't, you shouldn't underestimate the, the, the um, what um, Kant called the moral law within. He said, "Me, Kant." Full quotation was Q awoke from his dogmatic slumbers. I mean, a star is scarred by a bubble in the moral law within. If you can appeal to somebody morally, uh, that is really uh, morals are trumps. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have to appeal to anything else. And uh, this is why something as silly as egalitarianism is uh, you know, so, so very popular. It, 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 it does no good at all, it does nothing but damage. It does appeal to people morally. So we shouldn't worry too much about trying to find uh, some interest in it for them. Uh, if you can really make the moral argument, you're going to win hands down. But don't you need to somehow uh, disseminate the argument to enough people in the first place? And I think that's where the problem is. Um, well, I mean, you, they, once it starts to spread, it continues to spread. I mean, they, you know, it starts in a tiny room like this, and yeah. ends up on Radio 4, and then, it's, then they make a Hollywood movie about it. <laughs> The problem is there are also other, other viewpoints have been disseminated Please. against uh, us. But this, this from the man who spent his life arguing a non-moral case for libertarianism. That's right, yes. <laughs> yes, I do, I do that for moral reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe David Davis was right. Um, wrote an article in the Guardian a few weeks ago saying that um, the British are intellectually lazy when it comes to liberty. I don't know if any of you guys read that article. Yeah, I read it. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe he's right. Maybe you know people in Britain, British people, think that we don't care about liberty because they think that our government would never hurt us. Which is obviously a lot of rubbish because they do it all the time with their foreign wars for oil. They get blowback from people like ISIS. So maybe people just are just too lazy to care. So how, I mean, how do we? No, this is serious. It's your freedom that's on the line. They think, oh, I would never be in trouble in the UK. We're going to have a dictator. We're going to be safe. It's these sort of things which maybe people just think, I don't want to care about liberty because I have a stable government. No, I think I think there's possibly an element of truth in that. Though, having said that, I, mean, the, I think the ID cards thing was quite encouraging that you know people did really stand up against that. And I think the government realised that they were going to get a lot of people who just weren't going to have the ID cards no matter what and they didn't want to have to go full on police state to force them to do that so I think there is a problem at the same time I think perhaps there is a liberty is to an extent more ingrained in this sort of country than some of the other countries where um, I mean even look at Oswald Mosley I mean that was a pretty you know weak very sort of weak version of fascism compared with what they had in a lot of other countries um, you know, it just seemed rather silly here, and uh, it was all, all sort of relatively sort of wet compared with what they did elsewhere. So, I, I think you know, culture is important, but you're right. I think I think there's a danger when it happens very slowly as well. The erosion of liberty that people don't. It's was it the boiling frog? Is it? That's the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people you know, aren't aware. I mean, yeah. it's funny. I was 
speaking to someone, and he's, she said, I don't mind if the government have the access to all my bank details and records, and I was like, for her, what if you knew something about the government, and then use it and the black man? She was like, what never happened? I was like, are you sure? And it's just like there was just no care for the fact that privacy is gone. Yeah, I don't think a lot of um, people in the Muslim community understand that now because they are being, you know, blackmailed to join the security services or become informants or whatever. Generally, that is that is a very UK thing. Germany, that same question would be answered quite differently. Yeah, because they have a in recent memory in Eastern Why? Germany, yeah, yeah, yeah. they yeah. yeah. tried to survey every, everything. This country in particular is extremely optimistic about the goodness of of the authorities. And so. Yeah, and, and that's something I think we can push out as well as libertarians. We can you know, try and try, quiet, but exactly, we can. This is an area we can really try and to try and you know make hay with and say, come on, guys, you know this is extremely dangerous. But you know, I don't know whether it's going to make that much headway, and it's definitely not, not making any headway within the current Conservative Party. Put it that way. Mm. Uh, uh, it's it's quite dangerous. I, I just heard like the Ministry of Defense on BBC praising on this part, and he literally said like, despite of what Libertarian said, which mm -hmm. I, at least we got a name check. Yeah, I just yeah, get name check. But he did make the <coughs> argument of yeah, France that happened to France and not us because we have this strong surveillance system. Despite of what Libertarians think about it, mm. we praise more the security than liberty, and that's why we are not friends in this moment. And I'm guessing that they didn't, they didn't actually bother to have a libertarian on to, to argue mm. the contrary view. No, no, <laughs> Where they, they tend not to on that sort of issue. They just get, you know, someone, uh, it's a neocons mostly on there. So we need to see you more on the BBC. I've only seen you a few times. <laughs> yeah, I tend to be sort of in, in sort of bursts and then not yeah. on for a few months, yeah. I'm yeah. in transport. Yeah, HF2. That's yeah. Great. Not that you ought to be, but uh, not to Australia. <coughs> but uh, that's, oh, your, that's why they, in their file, if they, if well, the transport <coughs> thing. Quite, I mean, you know, I've done some other stuff that tends to be more patchy, yeah. Um, but they t they, that's another issue. They tend to sort of pigeonhole libertarians. They tend deserve a broader slot. Yeah, well, it's not really my forte, but nonetheless, they, they tend to sort of, the, a lot of the, the bookers in the media, they tend to think of it in terms of Labour versus Conservative, and they sort of shove you in the Conservative camp. But if you don't really fit into that sort of viewpoint, on which applies to quite a lot of issues, mm -hmm. so they tend not to phone us up about immigration, for example, because they think of us as a sort of on the conservative side where, where some people will tend to, you know, tend to be more liberal on that so um, that's another problem in itself they tend to get pigeonholed mm -hmm. it's like the left thing they were right and the right thing they were right yeah exactly yeah Pat? yeah, um, yeah I, I'd like to congratulate you on describing yourself as a proper libertarian I didn't actually describe myself as what most was saying <laughs> yeah I was just make, making the point that there are a lot of phonies out there and they're, they're often the ones that tend to do well you know I mean that's, if you look at look at the states for example some of those some of those um, guys in the beltway think tanks who've sold out completely and uh, you know, they're, they're often the ones that get the uh, you know articles in the newspapers well, and so on yeah, I mean they have a, a political ideology is one thing political theory the problem arise when you try to put these things into practice that, that's where all the problems come to, you know, whatever libertarianism or any any is. And um, I, I, I mean, I, I've heard some of the libertarian ideas about putting policies in practice that are uh, quite actually quite mad. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know. For example, what your your opinion would be on immigration? For it, to just give a simple that's example. That's um, you know, you, you have to have sort of, you have to have parameters, sort of legal parameters, or and for, for your own for your own existence. Otherwise, you will be like Christians in the Arabian Peninsula, welcoming the new immigrants called Islam. Mm. <laughs> You know, more than a half thousand years ago. Well, I mean, I think on that issue, yeah, on that issue, I mean, another problem is that you know, within the libertarian movement, there are lots of different views on this. So, so we had a recent debate with, uh, between um, Lou Rockwell and Kevin Carson, who had very different views on on migration. Though 
both of their views, if you like, were more refined than the sort of cookie cutter Beltway Washington think tank view on this. So you've got you know, three different approaches, and then obviously non 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 sort of specialists are going to get very confused by that. How do you deal with people that want to destroy your your whole idea? What do you mean? Like the who 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 do you have in mind? I think you're probably talking about migration and probably crisis, mm-hmm. I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. The refugee crisis. I mean, uh, have you come to grips with that yet? Well, we, we, what we can say is that you know current patterns of migration are very much the creature of big government. So it's not you know there are libertarian solutions to these these issues but then you're in the position of jeremy corby well you know you can say this and say that you know and you'll never be in power to really have to grapple with the real it's his moral duty to say what you so, no, no, he's made a very very good point because the issue of immigration is one where i think you know i consider myself a libertarian i won't give myself a title but the issue of migration i mean let's be serious you cannot control our own borders after you member of the european union we all know that right and the idea of free movement of people, it's very, very good in principle, but you've got to have checks of who's coming into the country. I mean, if what is reported to him is true, someone was able to come through Greece and one of the islands, come through France, blow up people and buildings in France. You can't, you can't have an open board, a borders policy with that. No. Well, of course, well, I don't think they care about the old, more closed borders of terrorists will come in. That's true, that's true but I mean, what I, I would say... No, it was illegal. I mean, take the refugee crisis, we all know there's probably at least, ten, probably at least a few percent that are probably radical jihadists that want to sort of dead in our throats, probably, but uh, as individuals. But, um, you know, we can't... It's not under the terror of the state to have some control of your borders, that's all. But the, but the question is who's... Is it the state stays in control of those borders, or do we have private borders? Well, that's the thing. I mean, if this, the only role for the state, the state of national defence, so it should be able, it should have a role in defending us against those sorts of people that want to. John, well, just to say that Patrick actually chose a very bad example to illustrate this because it's controversial among libertarians. Mm. It's, oh, like, it's, it's oh, a bit like he choosing abortion, which is also controversial. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, had he chosen almost anything else, there might be a libertarian <laughs> line yeah. on the issue, yeah. and, which could be uh, explained. <laughs> yeah. Soundbite. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that's the point. Yeah, that's a huge, huge difference. I think um, really part, part of the dispute between Rockwell and Carson was whether um, you can enclose these existing rights of way, and um, yeah. Rockwell seems to assume that they would have been enclosed in private property, whereas Carson assumed they would, if it had be common, common access. So, but that, that that quite small difference has quite big implications. Can, can I just say, just in my defence, I thought I chose quite a good example actually. The Arabian Christians. Well, there are I that was a very good example. No, what about the the Red Indians? Well, it's another example. Yeah. You just you just got that. Well, mm. yeah. I mean, you have to you have to preserve your ideal. You you, you don't self destruct. Do you? But, but, but it was different with obviously. Yeah, well, as I say, there, there are, you know. No, 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 really. But you, you can deal with that. No, you can have, you can have, you can have sort of um, well, voluntary communities that could exclude people. That's not anti-libertarian. So that is that immigrant? Is that immigrant? No, you, you, I mean, you don't, you don't have to deal with it because it's. You see, I mean, libertarians aren't nationalists. It is a big problem for the nationalist immigration is a tremendous problem because uh, you, know, you said you destroy yourself. What's likely to be destroyed is the nation. That, what that's... about the national anarchists, though, David? Yeah. There are no national anarchists. Yeah, there are. Who is a national anarchist? <laughs> it's a movement. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I would say a national anarchist is, 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 is someone who's confused. No, they're not. They're not because they. <laughs> no, because they. No, but they see. They don't. They define the nation as a, a kin group, not as a state. So they want to sort of close themselves off from from other people within the kin group. There is genuine there is a genuine movement. But that's a genuine well, movement. Well, I mean, actually, things were perfectly perfectly all right uh, before 1914, because what was happening before 1914, and it was a scandal, is that British capital was going was going all over the world. Now a lot of people thought it was just going into the British Empire. Where a lot of it was going into Argentina and places that had nothing whatsoever to do with the British Empire. Yeah. Uh, so what you get 
in, in a completely free trade world, is uh, the spread of, of, of capital to all these various places, building them up. Uh, and, and so you get an even world. So you lose the impetus to, uh, to immigration because Im the impetus to immigration is to uh, move where I can, for whatever job I get, whether it's a plumber or uh, an architect, I can get more money in the United States than I can in Britain. I can get more money in Britain than I can in India and so on. But it's not always about money. You might also pose uh, what It is mainly about money. Afghanistan that's caused all these people to want to leave those places. I wonder what, what the answer to that might be. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm afraid that that is uh, largely uh, a few bombs sent over by the US and the UK. With more than those, um, um, the, all these various rebel groups that were shipped over there. I mean, the examples you gave earlier about the libertarian communities in Africa, for example, I mean, a good, that's a good example. Communities that were destroyed very quickly. What well, well, libertarian communities? In, in, in the ones you mentioned in Africa, in Afghanistan. Oh, well, they're not, they're not, they're not really libertarian, they're stateless. Yeah, stateless, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, I mean, you have quickly, they're, they're taken over by... Somalia was invaded by the Kenyans and the Americans, yeah, 12 years ago. Well, basically... Mass immigration into Somalia. Well, yeah, the Ethiopians and, and Kenyans were used as mercenaries, effectively, yeah, right. by the US and EU, yeah. Right. The huge amounts of foreign aid pumped in as the quid pro quo. Mm. So we lost, we lost the Islamic courts. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone else wants to speak? Anyone else? Uh, we'll, well, we'll continue with any discussion that wants to be continued in the bar then, if you like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.